Welcome to Shotgun Story, the podcast that has conversations with indie creators about music, meaning, and the point of it all, so that you may be inspired by the journeys of other artists who are doing it for themselves, and maybe gain a little more understanding as to why it matters quite so much that you keep creating. Dave Stark is a folk singer-songwriter in the ancient British Isles troubadour tradition, the modern version, obviously. He's been in town doing the Chelsea Hotel show with me, and uh, he's going to fly back this afternoon, and so we thought we'd take this opportunity to have a little chat about all things music. Uh, hi, Dave. Hello. How are you? Well, I know how you are. You're great. <laughs> Thank you for making me tea this morning. Oh, what a pleasure. <laughs> I'm so glad I could. I was actually worried because we were running out of milk, and I thought if you came downstairs and tried to make yourself some tea and there was no milk, you uh, might be sad because I know you have a lot of milk in I do. Tea. Yeah. Thank you for that. Pleasure. Okay. So now, before you were a musician, you had a different life entirely. Mm, I've had a few different lives. I, um, I wanted to be a musician when I was sort of high school age, you know, teenager with a guitar, cool rock band, heavy metal kind of stuff. And my parents were kind of supportive about that idea in terms of playing music, not in terms of becoming a musician. That was just like an absurd kind of idea in their minds that you would, that would be your job. So like buy me all the equipment and drive me to band practices and all that kind of stuff. They're very supportive in that respect. And so I slowly got the idea that I probably couldn't become a musician from that. It was never really said out loud, but you kind of pick up on the vibes. So when I matriculated, I went off to university and I um, studied drama instead because I thought that would make me more employable, which of course is like absurd. absurd. <laughs> um, but yeah, I went to UCT, studied drama, carried on playing music always. I was involved in the folk clubs in Cape Town, you know, writing songs and the whole thing. I went very acoustic in my 20s. And then I found myself with a degree that I couldn't really do anything with. So I was working in a pharmacy, you know, just like a part-time student job in the evenings, working 6 to 9 p.m. And I've worked my way up in the pharmacy slowly, like for years while I was studying. And so for a few years after I got my BA degree, I was actually working in a dispensary at a pharmacy, initially initially for the Department of Health at Woodstock Day Hospital, and then in retail pharmacy. And then um, that kind of wasn't going, I kind of reached, reached my ceiling. I wasn't going anywhere with that. So I went back to university and I did a postgraduate diploma in education and I became a teacher. And then with that qualification, I applied for a whole bunch of jobs around uh, South Africa because I wanted to get out of Cape Town and go and discover myself. And I ended up getting a job in Ashawi Zululand, which is where I now live. It's in northern KZN. It's um, yeah, somewhere between Richards Bay and Kantla, kind of in the middle of nowhere, like rolling green hills, really beautiful. And so I taught for like 12 years. And again, I carried on playing music the whole time. And then at some point in my 30s, I was just like, no ways. Like, I'm just going to die at a school desk if I don't go and do music properly. So yeah, um, I quit, went into music full time. That's what I do now. Um, I write songs. I sing other people's songs. I record things. Um, yeah, I drive around, I sing at weddings. I do all kinds of music related things now, but that's all I do now is just music, which is great. It's taken me a long time. I'm 42 years old. So it took a long time from being like, say 16 and wanting to be a musician to being where I am now and actually having become one. Amazing. And that's rare. I think there are a lot of people who want to do that and have to get their jobs. Mm, sure. So now what are some of the highlights of your musical career so far? Ooh, okay. So, I mean, I'm intensely aware of where I am in my genre and how that plays out, particularly in the South African sphere. So I'm not expecting that I'm going to be like a chart topping, you know, radio play guy. So oh. my, my victories might sound small, <laughs> but they're very important to me. So, um, I've had some music used in television recently, which I'm really happy about. There was a wonderful South African production. Uh, it, was a, it was a series, in fact, called Recipes for Love and Murder, which was um, based on a book written by a South African author called Sally Andrew. And it was a combined uh, TV production between Mnet and an international company called Acorn that basically puts television stuff into the Commonwealth nations. So Australia, New Zealand, Canada, UK, South Africa, I think maybe even India. And g having one of my songs used for that was really, really great. I was quite honored. Um, and it's been cool to see how that song has traveled around the world as a result. When I go on my Spotify for artists, then I can see like people listening in, you know, Brisbane or wherever. And it's just cool to see how, how that song has like become like my biggest song now because it's on TV and people have Shazammed it. I'm like, I don't even know how Shazam really works. I don't even have it. But like people are like, yeah, oh, Shazammed your song. You know, like, <laughs> I'm in Canada. Like, you know, found it, like super dig it. So that's been a big thing for me. 
Um, I've entered some some song competitions, uh, UK song contest. I've entered twice. I've got a semi final place um, a couple of times. Um, that's been really really cool. And then just yeah, the fact that I get to be a musician at all is probably <laughs> my, my biggest achievement yeah. in in the sense that I haven't died yet. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I think th- th- those are my things. <laughs> I like those very much. In fact, I think those are far more valuable than the bigger ones that other people would recognize as. Yeah, Ac- actually, I mean, I-, I was on The Voice South Africa in season one, and I consider it one of my lowest achievements. Wow. Like, just like a completely vapid, hollow experience. Oh, my gosh, I did not even know yeah. that. Yeah, um, just, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. What is your experience as a performing artist in South Africa? Okay, so as I said before, what I do is a mixture of original content, cover content, tribute content. For example, what I've just done with you is a tribute show. Mm. It's, it's a part of my bouquet of offerings. And then I play original music when I can, but that's quite rare and quite difficult in this country, mm. um, especially if you want to get paid for it. So I spend a lot of my time playing covers mm. and I spend a lot of time traveling and playing covers to people who are essentially not really there for that experience. So it's washing over them in some way. Like mm. I'll play at shopping malls or at hotels or at restaurants or pubs and the music's there and it's sort of part of the offering that's happening, but it's not the main thing. You're not a featured performer. And funny enough, I earn most of my money doing that and get paid best to doing that all mm. the time. And then the tribute shows are great because you do them in little short bursts like we've done now where you go to a theater and you do like, you know, a weekend run of those shows. And that I love because it's songs that really matter to me and you can do it in a really purposeful way. And you've got a focused audience that are really listening to you and engaging with you. So you are featured uh, entertainment, which is great. And I love that. And then maybe as little as 10% of the time I get to play original music, which of course is why I'm a musician. But the realities are that in this country, that's a difficult thing to do. To make your money purely off original music is, uh, is hard. And it's not to say that people don't do it, but it's really hard. Mm. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, we were speaking earlier off air about the venues in South Africa. Okay, so venues in South Africa, what they do is they treat music as though it's just a utility. You know, so basically they, a person will open up, a, let's say, a restaurant. And they say, cool, I've, I've bought a restaurant, I've chosen a name, I've got to sign up. I pay my water bill, I pay my electricity bill, I get a chef in, so there's food, I get a barman, I put in some draft taps and there's some alcohol and now I need music and they just, they phone a promoter and they get music in. Music, just music, just the word music. Insert anything here because it's like electricity, it's just a thing. There's no curating, there's no selection, there's no thought given to it. It's just completely arbitrary as though it, it could be anything. It's like, oh, well, you know, paint the walls white, paint the walls blue, get a folk singer, get a reggae band, who cares? It's just music. Mm. There's like no thought. And it's so important to get the right song into the ears of the right person. It's the most important thing from a music management point of view. Yeah. You know, if you want to curate a good experience, the way to do that is to get the right people in front of the right people. Yeah. And some places do get this right, but they are a rarity. Most places don't give it a moment's thought. It is just pay the musicians, get them in, play for two hours, it works, it doesn't work. You know, there's no purpose to it, whatever. We did our thing, tick the box, move on, do it again next week. And I think that's such a missed opportunity. Oh, it's so sad. Mm. But what about in terms of your original shows? What is Turn Up like? Okay, so I like playing small audiences Mm. because I'm a folk singer and I'm a storyteller folk singer. So the whole thing is about looking into people's eyes, seeing their responses, you know, that engage. It's a relational thing. Mm. So audience size is less than 50, 25. 25 is great, you know. Um, I'd be so stoked if I can play a venue of 25 people that have arrived to hear me play songs that I wrote and hear me talk about them. That is like the best thing on earth for me. Yeah. Um, and it just doesn't happen very often. Um, so what people do, people in my position, we will play a cover set and we'll sneak in a couple of originals, you know, or we'll play an original at a wedding that we're singing at and <laughs> hope someone notices, you know, <laughs> generally they don't. Um, so you've got to really work hard at then as the writer, you've got to curate the audience experience. Now you're on the other side, you know, I've got to be selective about who I advertise to, who I get into that space. Mm. So I can honor their experience. I don't want to be like the guy I was talking about a moment ago, who's just arbitrarily throwing music at people. You know, it works both ways. Totally. And I mean, you mentioned something about cultural confidence. I know you speak about this. Mm. 
cultural confidence is a is a term that I just kind of I mean I didn't make up the words but I, it's a term that I just came to because it's something that that worries me about South Africa. So as a person mm-hmm. who's worked in education and who works in the performing arts, I think it's important that an individual is able to engage with an art modality of any type, visual art, dance, drama, you know, theater, whatever, music. They need to be able to go to that thing, experience it, decide for themselves whether they like it or not, mm-hmm. and then engage with it or not engage with it, with it based on that decision. Yeah. In order to do that, you have to be able to discern things. You have to know a little bit about the arts and you have to have the confidence in yourself and that your opinion is valid. Mm. What we have in, in South Africa is a lot of people are coming through the schooling system or how they're raised by their parents, not having confidence that their opinion matters in a meaningful way and therefore not being willing to discern publicly or bravely that they like or dislike something. Yeah. So, so we have all these people that are like, they'll go to a concert because someone told them it was good. Mm. You know, they'll go to see a musician because the song plays on the radio. It's almost a wag the dog thing. But no one's willing to go and take a chance on anything yeah. because they don't feel that they have the capacity to decide whether it's good or not. And that terrifies me that people don't feel that they have that, they have that right almost or that ability to just say, oh, you know, I went, to, it was, I saw a poster, photo looked interesting. It was around the corner from my house, a musician playing. I'm just going to go and see what happens. Mm. People don't do that here. People do do that internationally. Yeah. People do that in Berlin. They do that in, in Canada. They do that in the UK. We just have a problem here that we're not raising people and educating them into that headspace. Mm. So that worries me big time. And, and it plays out, it plays out at a higher level with the guy opening the restaurant who just gets music in yeah. because he doesn't feel that he has the right to discern what's good and what's bad for his for his customers yeah. and it, and at an even higher level it affects festivals you know festivals are being put together and some are great i mean you have to give credit where it's due there's some festivals in south africa that are really great about curating uh the performers to get a spread a mix of different types of genres, age groups. In our country, it's so important to have like representativity in terms of race and culture. Mm. But there's many festivals that don't give any of that any thought. They just look at which bands got the biggest Facebook following and who charges the least amount of money and get them to the festival. And let's just hope everyone gets drunk for the weekend and just bops around to happy, upbeat guy music. You know, again, missed opportunity. Terrifying. <laughs> because that guy who's running that festival 20 years ago was a guy who left school that didn't feel he had the cultural confidence to decide for himself what he liked or what he didn't like and just listen to the top 40. Yeah. I often think about that in terms of radio and the stuff that is played on radio and how it's all to sell advertising. Mm. And what you hear is everything else you are comfortable and familiar with. They don't want to put anything on the air that is going to make you uncomfortable for a moment Mm. so that you might switch off. Or change channels, yeah. Yeah. So that's the feedback loop. That's a reinforcing loop what happens there. So there's a certain type of music that's played on, say, the top 40. And new music can be added to that, but it must be music that's similar to that. Mm. So it feeds right back into that same thing. And the cycle just goes like this, round and around and around. It's like you can keep making music as long as it sounds like this. Yeah. As soon as you get too far out of the comfort zone, as you said, people are like, oh, I don't know if I want to be stretched this way on my drive to work in the morning. I'll mm. just, I'm just going to switch over to the other channel or go onto my Spotify playlist. You know, so there's no one's growing from that experience. Yeah. And and I suppose maybe it's our fault for expecting it to be any different because it's never going to be. Yeah. I mean, commercial radio is never going to be. No, no, it's not. And I suppose for a lot of humans, growing is not the priority. Mm. I Com- mean, comfort and like just survival and mm. peace of mind is the priority. Totally. And for artists, growth is number one. Mm. Yeah. I mean, so creativity is about change. It's yeah. not about sameness. It's never been about sameness. In fact, it, by definition, creativity is about newness. Mm. And newness has to come from change. And change has to come from constantly not being in your comfort zone. Totally. So yeah, we are at almost cross purposes as artists versus society and mm. how and how that happens. Like what, what matters to us and what matters to them and where we find each other and yeah. why. <laughs> oh gosh, and change is so hard. Mm. Yeah, of course. This is the thing as well. I mean, I know you're a parent also. Mm. is that we're so determined to make our children's lives happy and safe Mm. and as easy as possible because otherwise we feel like a bad parent. But perhaps if we early on let them experience age-appropriate hardships, Mm. they would become adults who were more comfortable with discomfort. Yeah, Yeah, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, sorry, I'm jumping in here, but art should be about grappling with something. 
Yeah. When I listen to a lot of things on the radio, and I sound so bitter when I say this <laughs> about people who are in the top 40, but I don't feel like there's a lot of themes being grappled with. I mean, I was listening to a rap song. I mean, my kid's 15. He listens to rap and hip hop and, you know, I'm a piano, house music. So I hear it, you know. I was listening to a song the other day. It was just like, the line was like, I pray to the Lord, Versace store. It's like, come on, man. You're just like, you're just dropping brand names into a line to sound like you're rich. Um, <laughs> conspicuous consumption. It's like, you're not grappling with anything. You've mm. got, you're sitting there on the top 40. You've got, a, you've got hundreds of thousands, maybe millions in South Africa of followers. Mm. And you're not grappling with anything. You're abandoning your duty as like a public figure, as an artist to grapple with things, <laughs> you know, yeah. make people think about stuff. Like missed opportunity, man. Because <laughs> you don't sound old at all. Yeah. Because <laughs> that rap music's bad. You know? <laughs> and I think what's so sad about it is, I think in particularly in South Africa, there's a lot to be grappled with. Can mm. you imagine the reach that they have, the, yeah. the young rap artists? Yes. Yeah. So, so there's what's called an integrity gap in a lot of entertainment stuff in South Africa because people are making their public persona and what they talk about, they're making it aspirational. Mm -hmm. So they say things like, oh, I'm going to shoot to the club and hit some Hennessy, you know, <laughs> you know. And like, again, it's just dropping brand names. But in reality, that guy's gotten on a taxi, you know, yeah. from Soweto and he's taxied into Joburg and he's gotten to a studio and he's sung his song about Hennessy and Bentleys and success and Mercedes Benz and all the women and the Versace. Mm. And then he's taxied back home. Yeah. There's a complete disconnect between what his reality of his life is. Yeah. And what he's singing about and how much more interesting would it be to hear what your life is like yeah young guy who's growing up in this south africa that is so complicated and so fraught yeah like i would much rather listen to you grapple with something oh speaking of grappling getting better being better growing how are you personally in the music spectrum growing i have these big moments of flatline i sort of do like big change write an album, record it like passion, furious effort, energy, money thrown at it. And then I plateau for long periods afterwards, like really long periods. And I, I released two albums in like reasonably close succession, I guess maybe a year and a half, two years apart after like 20 years of nothing. Mm. So like in my late thirties, I did two albums. Uh, since then I've done nothing. I've been in this plateau. So um, at the end of last year, I signed up for a master's degree in music because I felt I needed to be pushed and pulled and stretched and challenged. Yeah. So the title of the degree is actually music in the environment, but it's not really environmentalism. It's not supposed to be for people who are environmentalists, although that's something that interests me, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I am aware of, and I hope that I'm a responsible citizen in that regard, but it's actually more about looking at the environment as a model mm -hmm. and then importing those models into your life as an artist. And it can be, it doesn't have to be for musicians. This is this manifestation of this degree is focused towards musicians, but there are some other people that are doing it as visual artists and so on. So we look at ecosystemic theory and how you build an ecosystem that benefits everyone that's in balance, that's in homeostasis. So we talk about things like carrying capacity. So the earth has a carrying capacity for a certain number of human beings. Mm. And if we exceed that, our species will become extinct. You know, the whole thing will collapse. Well, the same applies to any industry or any person in any pursuit, but in music, for example, where I live in my tiny little town, there are enough people to maybe come to one concert a month. And to expect more of those people is completely unreasonable. It's beyond the carrying capacity of that town. Mm. If you live in New York City, you've got a lot more people. There's a lot more opportunity to do shows. But there's also a, a lot of other species, if I can use that word, other yeah. artists that are fighting for that carrying capacity. So basically, we look at sustainability studies and ecosystemic theory. And we talk about how you can get the resources that you need for what you're doing from your environment, how you build your environment or change your environment. But also, quite importantly, how do you feed that back into that homeostasis, into that ecosystem. Yeah. Like, what are my audience getting from me? I mean, beyond maybe just the music, which maybe is enough, but what are they getting in terms of that relationship? What is cycling through that whole experience? So it's, I mean, I'm only about 15% through the whole thing. Yeah. So it's early days, but like really, really fascinating. It's a Scottish university. I do it all online. Um, my classmates are from around the world, um, guy in Australia, um, two in Scotland, some in the islands, like in the Outer Hebrides. Um, very, very interesting different people doing different things, but like all just trying to work out how do you become an artist yeah. sustainably? Okay, so that's it. The sustainability is the thing. Yes. Yeah. So 
One of the ways that Dave and I initially got in touch was he asked me to perform and maybe chat a little bit at the Songwriters Festival that he was going to do here in South Africa. The South African Songwriters Festival that got canned by a fucking lockdown. Yeah, man. <laughs> I'm so like, <laughs> as you say, I can feel like my heart's sinking still, you know. <laughs> that, was one, that was one of my big, you know, explosive passion projects that I was talking about a moment ago, yeah. you know. I think we'd been through like a year of like COVID already. It was yeah. in like the second round, you mm. know. And I was like, you know, musicians in South Africa, people that I care about that are in my position, we need... We need a thing. Mm. Like I need a thing to like look forward to, to be excited about, to like throw my energy at. And so that's when I put it together. That's when I got in touch with you. And we, we phoned a whole bunch of other musicians and we got them all on board and people were flying from Cape Town and people were coming from Joburg and we had guest speakers and we had like a beautiful venue in this old, old like sort of wooden paneled theater in Durban. It was just all so perfect. And then it was all so fucked up. <laughs> Oh. And it just got taken away at the last minute. And I had gotten corporate sponsorship and, you know, I'd gotten favors from people and made promises to people. And it was so disheartening. And you wrote a song about it. I did. About the disheartening cancellation of that whole thing. Yep. Which cool. is a really, really beautiful, poignant song. Everything is canceled. You canceled. Canceled. Right? Canceled. Yeah. Oh. I mean, what was your vision? So I believe, I mean, and as you sort of alluded to in, in your intro, that... The singer-songwriter is this ancient, almost like cloth, you know, like there's the warrior cloth, mm -hmm. you know, and there's the healer cloth, you know, like it's this ancient role in our cultural heritage that the keeper of stories, the singer of songs, the person who grapples with things on behalf of the community. <laughs> the re we are supposed to suffer on behalf of our people yeah, so we can grapple for them. You know, that's what we do. And I really believe that. I believe it's like singer songwriters are important that there's this direct line between what you write and what comes out of your mouth. Yeah. It's not this disconnect. Someone's not writing a song for you. Mm. Like this is me. Here we go in my failing, aging voice. Yeah. You know, because that is important, not because of the beauty of the sound necessarily, but like the honesty of it. So. I looked around at all the festivals in South Africa, many of which I find very disappointing because they are just about like, hey, let's get drunk and party. And I don't want to knock that as a human pursuit because I love that stuff as well. <laughs> but I feel it's very well represented in festivals. Like yeah. this party vibe, upbeat, woo, you know, like let's all play some loop based music and it's all in 4-4 time and it's all in major chords and it's like super upbeat. And it's like, cool, I get it. You know, yeah. I like that too sometimes. But I also like dark and twisty minor key 6-8 stuff, you know? <laughs> So I said, like, I want to put together a festival that, like, that honors, like, song singer-songwriters mm. and is, like, doing something that's, a, like, a bit different, smaller venues, less of the party atmosphere, more of the focused listening thing that I've become almost addicted to, yeah. like, from my work in theater. You know, that, like, well-behaved audience, just, like, really focused attention. So then I started thinking about musicians that I really like, such as yourself, and I got in touch with them. And, like, this is what I want to do. This is my dream. And our plan was we were going to have a, a two days of musical performances, but – in the mornings before the audiences were there, we were going to just sit and have these round table discussions. I, I would love to still do that part. I'd love to get eight songwriters in a room over lunch, yeah. you know, and just like talk about what's your life like, you know, what's working, what's not working, what, what venues are good for you, what is bad, like, how's your mental health? Like, are you okay? <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. Like, it's just such a, it's such a hard, weird life. And we're so bad at, at our camaraderie. You know, I mean, we're all cool with each other, yeah. but I'm saying our real bonded, like, let's sit down and like, you know, unpack our lives. So we were going to do that outside of the, the performances. We were going to film some of that. You were going to do some podcasts and we would just make like a bank of knowledge and experience of those people. Yeah. And I thought it was such a great idea. It was such a great <laughs> idea. And yeah, it didn't happen. Oh, it didn't happen. It was very, very, very sad because I think it would have been magnificent. And I'm hoping that at some point yeah. you, you can feel the enthusiasm to restart the idea. Yeah, I'm sort of scared now still. Mm. Like I'm still scared from like the, the failure of it a and like the of, loss of money. And I'm just like, oh, man. A little bit of PTSD. Yeah, sort yeah. of, yeah. yeah. Speaking of listening audiences, I know that on the weekend, Nana, we had an, a table of, of talkers mm. during our very listening set. What is the solution? Okay. I, I have like lots of strong feelings on this because this happens all the time. Mm. I spoke earlier about how I do a lot of cover sets. Yeah. And I know that I'm going to be ignored. And it's fine. And I can just, I can plug in my guitar and it's almost meditative for me. I can just like plug in and I know which songs I'm going to play and I'll play for three hours. Yeah. And I just, and then people clap. Cool, they don't clap, also cool. 
But if I'm going to be presented as a featured entertainer, then I do actually have an expectation that I will be listened to. Yeah. And so, again, it comes down a little bit to venue ownership and p- how people curate their, their, their customer experience. Because people should know from the start that that's what's going to happen. They shouldn't find out. I felt kind of bad for those people. I was upset that there were people that were just going to, like, eat and chat and pass the salt. And, hey, you know what? I saw Jim the other day at work. He was, ah, ha, ha, ha. You know? <laughs> um, like, that, that irritated me from the mm-hmm. stage. But those people were just out for a night having a good time with people they love and doing another beautiful human pursuit. But it was interfering with my beautiful human <laughs> pursuit at the, t- at the time. So people need to know from the beginning that that's what's going to happen. And yeah. there are venues in South Africa, and I'm going to give them their, their credit. Yes. M- music in the Hills in Hilton, you know exactly what you're going to get. They have a curated audience experience. There is a restaurant on site, but the music doesn't happen there. When you step inside the door, you are sitting down, you're not chatting, you're listening to three musicians who play that night. The Elma Cafe that we both played in Cape Town, mm. I mean, big shout out to the Elma. They probably have the best trained audience <laughs> in South Africa. Yeah. They're just small venue. I mean, I think they max out at about 40 something seats, but they serve the food, they get it out the way. You sit down, cell phones are off, you listen. You know, people who speak get thrown out <laughs> and it's militant and it must have been hard in the beginning. And it's one of those things we were talk- like we were talking about being a parent in the car. Yeah. You sometimes got to be hard on people to make them better. Yeah. I know that if I can get someone to listen to me, I mean, I know with almost certainty that if I can get someone to really listen to me, I can move them mm-hmm. emotionally. Yeah. But I have to get them to that point. And, it- <laughs> and sometimes you've got to be a little bit of a dick <laughs> or the venue has to be, or someone yeah. has to be on your behalf to say, Hey, there's something happening here that you need to give your attention to totally because it's important and important things are sometimes difficult or they, they require you, something of you. And I, I consider attention to be a currency. Yeah. So one of the ways that I'm paid as a singer songwriter is you give me your attention. It's a currency for me, you mm. know? So I think I'm starting to ramble on that point. (laughs) But yeah, I think people must know from the beginning what what their expectations are. I think maybe those people that we had the other night went out to dinner and there was going to be music. And cool, what a beautiful thing to eat and have music playing. But actually, I wanted them. I I wanted them to be moved by the music we were playing. Yeah. Well, I suppose that's part of it. The moving is is healing. Mm. It connects with your stuff. And when your stuff comes up, you get to look at it and get better. Exactly. It's like, okay, so food nurtures you, right? Mm. You take a spoonful of food, it will nurture you, but you have to put it into your mouth and swallow it. Yes. You cannot stick it into your eye. <laughs> you, cannot, you cannot pour it on your ear. Yeah. You, know, you cannot smear it on your skin. <laughs> it, has to be, it has to go into the right portal. Yeah. And the portal needs to be open. And yeah. the portal is the ear and, and the mind and the attention. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Tell me a little bit about your songwriting process. Well, I'm rather embarrassed to say as a person who spent a lot of time writing songs is that I mostly do it out of like desperate overwhelm. Yes. I, I'm not like a disciplined songwriter. I know people that are and I'm so impressed by them, but it's not my way. My, my way is to sort of live until I bash my head against some sort of experience that I can't deal with and then write a song about it. Yes. So there's a favorite quote of mine, and I really, because it's a favorite quote of mine, I should probably remember who said it, and, <laughs> and I don't. But it was one of the writers, it wasn't a songwriter, um, it was a, a writer, writer, literature writer, and he said, it is a fool who sits down to write who has not stood up to live. And basically, because we're storytellers, as artists, our primary responsibility is to live mm. fully. And our secondary responsibility is to create based on that experience. Yeah. So I live fully. I mean, yeah. And then I, like I said, I eventually will get to some point where something happens that I can't deal with. Mm. I don't have the human basic capacity to deal with it. So I use my artistic capacity to deal with. It is an interpretive, sometimes self-reflective, sometimes self-healing, sometimes therapeutic, sometimes terrifying thing. But it's based on some thing that I can't cope with yeah. that I have to you know, unpack yeah. some other way. And that's why I think it has validity for other people who then maybe don't have to have, have that exact experience yeah, because someone's done it on their behalf. It sounds a bit messianic. I don't, I don't mean it to be. I don't mean we're, like, we're just like giving our lives for the, <laughs> the world, you know, <laughs> like in a Lord and Savior kind of way. I mean, it's very interesting <laughs> because to be honest, I feel very similarly about it. So you're completely speaking my language. And often I wonder, I think, oh gosh, maybe I should have gone on to be a preacher rather than a musician. Preachers are again, an ancient 
role. Mm. You know, they do it maybe in a different way, but they're also grappling with the ungrappleable with in many ways mm. and trying to do that on the behalf of other people who maybe can't spend the time, the emotional uh, sort of expense on doing that. So it's like, I will do this for you and mm. I will distill some sort of uh, important lesson, message, thing for you. Mm. It's my role to do that for you. Like, totally. so as a preacher would, would do that, you know, and a lot of people would do that, you know, yogis, you know, any kind of um, sort of spiritual leader, I think. Totally. I suppose it's also to your dharma. Mm. It's like your, your gift. Yeah. You don't get to decide what your gift is. Sure, you don't. And, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the hero's journey. Yeah. So in the hero's journey, which is like this ancient sort of story structure that we have, particularly in Western storytelling, but I think globally, but particularly in Western storytelling, there's like the hero is this call to adventure. And the hero is, you know, has to go and rescue someone or achieve something. And he always says no, always tries to resist it. Mm. And like most of the artists I know always try and do something else because it's like, do I have to, you know, like, it's going to be so hard. Can't I just become an accountant, please? You know, like everyone tries, tries to resist. I mean, yeah. you try to, and you said something yesterday that was so, that was so great. You said, we always try and resist what is to our greatest benefit. What did you say? In fact, Stephen Pressfield speaks yeah. about it in The War of Art, quite a, a well-known book of his. He talks about how you only resist things that are for your higher good. Yeah. And for artists, our higher good is to become artists. Uh -huh. But it's not the easiest thing for us to do. Mm -mm. It is just the only thing for us <laughs> to do. So in my book that I'm trying to, well, not my book, but the book that I love that I'm trying to get you to read, which is The Great Work of Your Life, it's basically a, a study of the Bhagavad Gita, but in terms of the artist's life yeah. through the lens of that. And one of the things he says is like, you, you can't become whatever we, you want. You can only become what you are. Yeah. And we just are musicians. You know, you can fight that as much as you want and you can have misery either way. Mm. You can be miserable because you're not an artist or you can become an artist and be miserable with that. And I think, <laughs> and I think the latter is better. A hundred percent. In fact, I often think of uh, Martha Beck as well because she talk of some, talks of something called um, shamanic illness. Mm, yeah. And I think it's the same thing. The calling. The is calling, yeah. Exactly. Is if you are not doing what you are called to do, you will get sick. Yeah, I, I was I was listening to a oh man. I've got to start writing people down. But I was, <laughs> I was listening to like a little video clip on Instagram or Facebook or something where a guy was talking about creativity, and he says like, "Why do all my um, artist friends get sick when they're not like working at their thing?" Mm. And he started to think about. It. He says, "Well, we basically become hypochondriacs because we make things up. So when we don't make things up, we end up making things up." <laughs> <laughs> because we're not oh, making up that. albums; we're making up illnesses. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So a musician's life is fairly hard on the body. You and I have been talking a bit about that as mm. well this weekend. Yes. Uh, especially when you're on tour. Um, there are late nights and a few too many drinks often as you're socializing with people after shows and all of those things. What do you do to I, stay I, healthy? I'm really bad at that. It's something that I perennially want to get better at. Like, I mean, I was, when I, even when I was sitting at the airport on Saturday when I was flying down here, I was like, I can't, I can't go on like this. You know, I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm working a lot at the moment. So I'm doing like 16 shows a month, mm. which is a lot. Yeah, it is. Um, but it's, it means it's a lot of takeaway food. It's a lot of late night driving. It's a lot of sleep deprivation. I'm also, a, I'm a single parent, not in the, the global sense, but in the primary caregiver sense, I'm a single parent, mm. which means that regardless of what time I get home, I need to be up at quarter past five, you know, tea on, breakfast made, sandwiches, school. So it's a lot of sleep deprivation or interrupted sleep cycle. I mean, mm. I can sometimes go back to sleep, but I don't necessarily. So I'm bad at that. There are things that I can control about that. I can't really control the parenting thing too much, mm. um, but I can get better about the food thing, but it's going to mean like making food, packing food, storing food. It just requires a better way of living because at the moment, yeah, you know, like it's, it's an enormous amount of saturated fats, garage pies, Coca-Cola, <laughs> <laughs> you know, driving, driving, driving. Um, it's, yeah, and of course, alcohol is this just like pervasive part of our, our lives as entertainers. And I know you're so great about it. I mean, you like, you don't really even like to drink when you mm. perform. And I always like to get my buzz on a little bit, you know. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that what your buzz means, what it looks like is very variable depending mm. how you're feeling. It's not you just want, like it's chasing the dragon. You just want one more. I had an interesting conversation with a friend of mine who's now a full-time touring guitarist in a tribute show. His mm. name is Rusty Red. He's uh, mostly based down in Australia. 
he's working for a company that does tribute shows for like Queen and the Eagles, like big, but like big theatrical productions with lights and costume and the whole thing. But they, they'll play like 25 shows a month mm. in like, 12 different cities, you know, and it's packing up and flying and driving. And again, like the food, and, but the alcohol is this thread that everyone uses either to buzz up or to calm down or because they're lonely. I mean, he talked, he talked with such honesty about the loneliness of how you can be the, how you can be a lonely person in a, in a theater of 2000 people and stage with five other people that you love. And you can be the loneliest person there. Mm-hmm. There's so much about that that people don't understand. Because you're not alone, but you're just terribly lonely. You haven't been in your bed. You haven't seen your dog. You haven't seen your kids. You know, like all these things that happen. And alcohol is this cushion. It's this uh, security blanket for a lot of people. And it's and it's so, so big in our industry. I mean, in my experience, all, all the musicians I know, let's say, well, almost all the musicians I know, either drink a little bit too much mm. Or they don't drink at all because they used to drink a little bit too much. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's like a different version of the same problem. Yeah. It's it's so, so big. And uh, I, I wish I could be better about that. It's something I want to work on as well. Just like, why isn't the music enough? Mm. Like, why isn't the fact that we get to get on stage and do that? Why isn't that enough? Like, just in terms of the chemicals and the, the endorphins and the adrenaline. Like, why aren't those chemicals enough anymore? Or were they ever enough? Why, why weren't they ever enough? I, I don't know. But it is for some people. There are, there are musicians that give up entirely. They give yeah. up everything. They become like real straight edge, you know, and they go vegan and they do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It's possible. It's just, it's not the norm, I think, is the thing. And, and we have one of the few jobs where not only is it, is it accepted that you drink at work, it's encouraged. Yeah. I drive sometimes three hours to go play a gig. Play my last chord, put my guitar down, and someone arrives with a tray of drinks for me. Yeah. I'm going to drive three hours home, but it's like the presumption is I'm a musician. I'm going to want to party with whoever buys me a drink. Or like, hey, man, you musos, let's buy you a drink, brew. Yeah. It's like, actually, I've drunk water the entire evening. I'm going to do a three-hour car trip home, get home one in the morning, go sleep and wake up and sort out my kid. Yeah. And it's not, it's not like I said, it's well-intentioned, but it's very presumptuous. Yeah. You just send someone a drink. No one says, like, what would you like? Can I get you a Coke or a water or something? It's like, no, have a pint of my favorite beer or have this tequila. It's like, what? okay. <laughs> Oh, that's wonderful. Two last questions. Mm. Advice for anyone who wants to do this. Do it, regardless of the consequences, Mm -hmm. uh, I think is the first one. It's hard for me to say I would do it differently, like whether I would just become a musician at age 20, because I learned an enormous amount by not being a musician that I bring to my musicianship. Yes. So having worked in like very professionalized environments, like firstly in pharmacy and then in education and then in educational management, I bring a sort of level of punctuality, clear communication, financial management, all those skills that I learned all those years, I bring that into my musical life. Yeah. And they're very valuable. And they're things that I think people who just become musicians straight out of high school maybe don't get, or they learn it a much harder way later on, or they deal with the consequences of never, never learning it. So I would say, as much as I'm saying do it, um, that doesn't mean you have to, it has to be the first thing that you do. And mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that if you don't do it immediately, that you can never do it. I mean, I became a full-time musician in my 30s. Mm. So absolutely do it my other thing is about sort of this life <laughs> it, it is it's so it's so thankless often that you have to know that you don't do it for anyone else really you do it absolutely for everyone else <laughs> but you might never get that affirmation yeah so it's a it's a sacrifice that you might never get appreciated for it's yeah but it's it's important to do it anyway it's important to do it for you because it is who you are it's, I, I guess, I mean, getting back to like religious theme, it's like being called to the priesthood. You know, mm. it's, you're going to feel it somewhere in the pit of your stomach. You'll be sitting there and like, hey, well, I want to do this thing, but you can't say it out loud. You can't manifest it. You don't want to disappoint your parents. <laughs> you don't want to be, you don't want to be broken, never have a car. You know, there's all these things that are going to play into your mind. But, you know, what was that other quote we said yesterday? It's like, it's a, it's a hard way to make a living, but it's a great way to make a life. Yes. You know, like living in an art, as an artist is wildly complicated and messed up. But it's a pretty, pretty cool life. Oh, it's magical. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what we were saying actually yesterday is that at our, our audience yesterday was this collection of magnificent, magical human yeah, beings. Yeah, they were like unicorns. Yeah. You know, they were just like, like a different, different species of just like wonderful 
people, like so wonderful. Yeah. So yes, you do get affirmations, but you don't get the kind of affirmations that you expect. You don't, people don't applaud you. They don't recognize you <laughs> when you walk into a room. I mean, they do if you're super famous, but most, most singer songwriters around the world, I mean, which is my sort of sphere, are like unknown, you know, like mm-hmm. they people might recognize their songs, the song gets used on TV or maybe they play on the radio or you have this cult following, but you're not going to be famous necessarily, but that's not, that's not why you do it. If you're doing it for that reason, that then you're chasing the dragon and you're never going to get there. Like a complete waste of time. Do it because that's how you want to spend your time because you can't do anything else because if you did anything else, your body would get, make you sick. Yeah. That's it. You know? So do it. Definitely. On your own terms. When you're ready. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Okay. So I know you, have, you haven't been in a car for a little bit. When you were in your car, what was playing on your playlist? Oh, that's interesting. I, I tend to not listen to music when I drive, mm-hmm. which surprises a lot of people. I don't like to listen to music in a unintentional way. Mm. If you know what I mean, I like to really listen to music. Yeah. So I'm, I'm inclined to maybe listen to half an hour of music a day, like sitting in front of the speaker, mm. listening to it, than I am to put on a playlist. So when I drive, I normally listen to podcasts, okay. um, much more likely. But at the moment, I'm listening to almost exclusively podcasts about the Ukraine war. Okay. So like I've spent maybe 300 hours on the oh. Ukraine war in the last oh. little while. So that's my big thing in terms of listening. However, in terms of what, who do I listen to just mm. musically? So I love, I love, love, love. And I think he is an entire lesson in songwriting on his own. Uh, an American musician called Josh Ritter. Mm. He's not like mega famous. He's like medium kind of famous. Like he's, he's like a permanently full-time touring North American musician. Mm. He's like a massive inspiration. I love him. So I listen to a lot of his um, stuff. There's a, a musician in the Netherlands that I really love called Van Veek. Mm-hmm. Um, she's a, a female singer-songwriter. She's got a band, but like she's the, the front woman. Also just, just so poignant. It's wonderful. She, she sings in English. Just wonderful, wonderful. Love her. And then I listen to a lot of old music. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very much in the sort of 60s, 70s songwriter sphere, which is why we do shows like that. And so I love Leonard Cohen. I love um, Jackson Brown. I know you do too. I listen to Crosby, Stills & Nash, uh, James Taylor, um, Bob Dylan, of course. I mean, like the, the sort of expected ones. Yeah. But I suppose if, if you wanted to get something from me that you didn't know before, I'd say check out Van Veek, uh, check out Josh Ritter. Those would be a really good place to start in terms of like seeing how people are being singer-songwriters and really killing it. Yeah. Yeah. Social media. Mm. What is the one you are most present on? I only want that link. Uh, that's easy. I think I probably do my best stuff on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And that's just Dave Stark, one word. Brilliant. Oh. It's got an E at the end, though. Yes, it has an E at the end. It's very important to differentiate us from the other Starks, like Tony Stark. You know. I don't know who that is. You know Tony Stark? <laughs> I, Iron Man. Oh, I, I mean, in my brain, I knew that, but I knew that you couldn't be talking about him. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about him. Yeah, no, we have, we have an E at the end. Um, yeah, that's, that's me, Dave Stark. It's part of my singer-songwriter thing. Is like I can't really be anything else, so may as well just use my name, hey? Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah, this has been so fun. Mm, thank you. No, thank you. And thank you for driving me to the airport later. <laughs> 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 and again for making me tea. <laughs> If you are an independent artist whose passion for what you do can inspire or fuel others, get in touch. I'd love to chat. You can find me on shotguntory.com. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts. How make them better than anything you've heard. All you have to do is burn them after reading. And see the walls I've built, my borrowed cat, the blood I've spilled. All that's left to do is burn it as you're leaving. The shifting boundaries getting loose. Circles round our world of two.
book Your broken frame The wine is warm The song remains the same But everything feels different When you're yearning I'll dress in black You dress in white You'll be the day And I'll be the night We'll be side by side In the gentle light of morning Shifting boundaries Getting Circles round our world of two High five the moon Embrace the dark Untie your hair Unlock your heart Everything unravels Without warning Come read my letters Consume my words I'll make them better Than anything you learn All you have to do Is burn them after reading Burn them after reading Burn them after reading, burn them after reading.